National Collections is committed to developing archival collections that equitably represent all communities residing within Southwest Florida. We work diligently to foster partnerships through fundraising to expand access to unique and rare primary resources, as well as to deliver diverse and inclusive educational programming here at FGCU and throughout the community. If you would like to support the archives and believe in our mission, please visit our online giving portal by using the donation link being dropped in the chat box. Under the designation, please select University Archives and Special Collections to make your contribution. Programming like this one is possible, is made possible by the support of the community. And so we thank you for your continued support. And with that, I am happy to introduce our moderator for tonight's event, Jared Eady. Jared Eady is a fourth generation resident of Fort Myers and an alumnus of Fort Myers High School. At FSU, he majored in political science with minors in history, urban and regional planning, and Black Studies. Jared serves on various Southwest Florida boards, including Fort Myers Community Redevelopment Agency Advisory Board, the Alliance of the Arts, and WGCU. He is also a member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. He is currently the Director of Diversity and Inclusion and the Director of Advancement via Individual Determination Program for the School District of Lee County. And with all of that on his plate, he still made time for us this evening. And with that, I introduce you to Mr. Jared Eady. Thank you. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us, as well as our panel. We're so privileged and honored to be here at Florida Gulf Coast University and for our friends here at the library who have taken the opportunity to expand the community's history and tell a very interesting and compelling story. Before we get started, I would like to allow our panelists to introduce themselves before we jump into our questions for the day. And I'll start with Ms. Greta Campbell. Good evening. My name is Greta Campbell, and I am a native of Fort Myers High School, graduating from Cypress Lake High School after Dunbar High School was closed. Um, I am so proud to be here, but I also am privileged that you are here also. Ms. Young? Good evening. I, my name is Matty Shoemaker Young, and I too am a native of Fort Myers, Florida. I graduated in 1971 from North Fort Myers High School, and I'm so happy to be here um, tonight um, to speak on behalf of our, uh, our experience with integration. Thank you, Ms. Young. Mr. Barnes? Good evening, my name is Charles Barnes. I'm chairman of the Family Aid Society. I'm a graduate of North Fort Myers High School also, but in 1976. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Barnes and Dr. Knight. Good evening. I'm Harrison Shedrick Knight, uh, the lead pastor of the Trinity Church. Um, graduated with the class of 73 from Fort Myers <clears throat> High School. Um, a member of the board of directors for the Collaboratory, formerly the Southwest Florida Community Foundation. And I also serve as the community chair. And I'm honored and a pleasure to be here with everyone, my peers, this evening. Right. Thank you all so much. And it's great to be such a distinguished panel. All of you I consider to be family. Amen. So thank you all for uh, having this conversation with you and our attendees. But before we get started, it's important, Mr. Barnes, you mentioned that you're chair of the Lee County Black History Society. Mm -hmm. The roots of this conversation goes back to the establishment of the Williams Academy. In 1913, the Williams Academy was established as the first government-funded school for Black children here in Lee County outside of the educational opportunities that Mr. Nelson Tillis provided for his family on a private level. But to take us back a little bit closer to contemporary history, the great Dunbar High School opens in 1926-1927, and that provides the epicenter as Dunbar School, educating our kids on a high school level with the support provided from the Williams Primary, and then eventually Dunbar Elementary that opens, and also Franklin Park Elementary. But to really get the uh, real context of segregation here in Lee County, it's important to understand some of the personal experiences. So you all were reared here, here in this city, Fort Myers and in Lee County. Do you have any experiences that you recall from your time here during the area of segregation that you would like to share? Any, any experiences or memories that really stick out to you during your early formative years growing up here during the times of segregation? Well, um, I remember when, uh, when we first integrated um, the district started out with uh, the Freedom of Choice Plan mm -hmm. to satisfy uh, the integration requirements. 
And um, I really didn't have a choice as far as uh, integrating. My mom was president of the NAACP, Veronica Shoemaker at the time. And uh, my neighbor down the street, uh, Mr. Blaylock, mm -hmm. uh, he worked and filed the lawsuit on behalf of his daughter, Rosalind Blaylock, to integrate the schools. So I, uh, when we first went through choice, uh, a, a lot of my classmates stayed at the all black schools, but I was one of the, one of the first ones, uh, given the fact that my mom was such a trailblazer and I had to, to move forward uh, with integration. I was one of the first to uh, transfer okay. over uh, to what was at the time Fort Myers Middle School. And I was a ripple. Yeah, <laughs> ripple moving school. to a way. Uh -huh. right? that, that's correct. Right. Right? Uh, so, Mr. Barnes, on that point, thank you, Ms. Young, for that one, and that's an interesting segue. Uh, Mr. Barnes, your father was one of the first black male police officers here in the city of Fort Myers. In 1952, he was hired mm -hmm. to be a part of the city of Fort Myers Police Department in what they call the Dunbar Heights Force. Uh, right. Did your father ever share any experiences from a law enforcement standpoint? Because we know that the segregation laws not just covered education, but it was housing, it was economic development, and also law enforcement. So did your father ever share any experiences with you about his time as a police officer here in the 1950s? Uh, definitely. Uh, even with the fact that when they hired him, they made sure that they publicized in the paper that he was a black deputy hired for the Dunmore Heights area. That was letting the community know, the white community know, that he was a police officer, but strictly to enforce the laws in the Dunmore community. Uh, he had no authority to arrest anyone outside of that community. He had no privilege to actually even drive a police car. My father was on for 10 years. He told my boys alive to drive a police car. The chief simply said that if you sit in that seat, you know, the officer won't sit in that seat. So for those first two years, my father pretty much drove his own car uh, throughout that community. And so uh, then he had no rights to arrest any white person regardless of what crime they committed. He could detain them. He could call for some white car to come and get them. Uh, the chief just didn't look right for a black man to be arrested somewhere at the driving downtown. Okay. Thank you. So you got anything to add, Dr. Knight? Um, also similar uh, to Maddie, with my mother being an educator uh, and um, being, you know, pro-integration and a trailblazer uh, and being the eldest of four, four children. Um, I was in that first wave, 1968 through 69. Uh, to integrate Fort Myers Junior High School, mm -hmm. uh, and um, the transition went well. Went well, uh, no problems. Uh, everyone pretty much stayed in their lane. Okay. We went to school, got our education, and we came home. Came home. <laughs> so we're gonna and, come back to. And unlike <clears throat> their parents, uh, my parents, Richard Stebbins and Helen Stebbins, my mother wasn't a rabble riser, but those who know Mr. Richard Stebbins, mm -hmm. you know okay. that That's he right. was going to go against the grain. Mm -hmm. And so he was insistent that I was going to stay at Dunbar High. Okay. And at that time, they talked about closing Dunbar High, but there was never any... Um, any documented plan to close it. And so I can remember that last year that we were there, we, were still, we, we would have class dues and we still had class dues. The community had purchased a bus for Dunbar High School that we called Tin Can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, we were still just going about business as usual not knowing what was to come. But, you know, my dad being the rabble rouser that he was, he insisted that I stay at Dunbar and I stayed there until they closed in the summer of 1969. Okay. And I say the summer because when we left school in 1969 for, that, for the end of that school year, teachers nor students had any idea that this was coming. So Ms. Campbell, you mentioned your parents. Uh, Mr. Richard Stebbins and Ms. Helen Stebbins were educators here, but you also have a connection with history in the state of Florida. Uh, can you tell us about your uncle Charles Stebbins and what he did in 1941 relative to equity and teacher pay for black educators? In 1941, my uncle Charles Stebbins sued the state of Florida and Thurgood Marshall was his attorney, his representing attorney, and he sued them for equal pay 
for black teachers because white teachers were on one pay scale and black teachers were on another pay scale. Um, at that time, he had a young daughter and a wife. His wife was sick and subsequently died, but uh, he won the lawsuit. But the provisions of the lawsuit were that he could never again teach in the state of Florida. And so he left Florida and moved to Washington, D.C. His daughter eventually came back to Fort Myers, Charles L. Stebbins, and lived with my aunt Lilla Stebbins Johnson until she graduated from high school. But that was supposedly the provisions of that, not supposedly, <coughs> though, that was the provisions of the lawsuit. And so uh, as my aunt Lilla would say, he won, but he lost. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Campbell, how did your family's activism through education <coughs> shape and gear your thoughts toward equity and justice? Well, if you know my father, what he talked a lot about was nobody's going to ever give you anything. Mm -hmm. You've got to always be better. You've got to always be more prepared. And he would also say that you need to learn all that you can learn because what you get in your head, they can't take from you. If you put it on a piece of paper, you might lose the paper. Somebody might steal the paper mm -hmm. or whatever. But he said, you get it in your head. And so he was a proponent of education. My mother, who graduated from Dunbar High School in 1932, um, was, was, was a little less uh, rambunctious about it, but she, her, she was an only child. And so her parents sent her to college, but she too believed in education. And that was all that I ever knew. I was speaking with my cousin today and in our family, our grandmother could not read and write. And she was insistent that all of her children, and my dad was the youngest of her children born in 1920. Okay. All of them had a high school education <coughs> and four of them had a college education. Mm -hmm. And she was insistent. Now they went to school on a GI Bill. It wasn't that she mm -hmm. could afford it because she couldn't read it right. And so those roots for being uh, proponents of education went even before my parents into their, to their parents. So that shows the connection across generations. And to that point, mm -hmm. I wanna go back to you, Ms. Young. You mentioned your mother, the great Dr. Veronica Shoemaker. She was the president of the Dunbar Elementary PTA while mm -hmm. you were a student, mm -hmm. and that gave her prominence in the community before her eventual election as the first Black person to be a member of the Fort Myers City Council. Mm -hmm. Growing up in those years, what was it about your mother's dedication toward equality and justice that shaped your thoughts and perceptions so far? Well, um, the one thing that, 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 that was key was with her being the president of the NAACP, that was where she developed her leadership skills. And um, she had that on the job uh, training for leadership. Uh, my mom was one that she felt that we were all equal mm -hmm. and that no one was better than we were, that um, education was the key, and that uh, as far as equality, uh, we could perform uh, in any environment. And she felt that uh, we could stand and deliver and that we set the standard. Mm -hmm. That was her thinking. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I realized that uh, I had to perform. I had to perform. And so for our attendees tonight for the panel, if you'd like to learn more about Dr. Veronica Shoemaker, she's a centerpiece in this exhibit along with Dr. Knight's mother, who we're gonna transition and talk to after our next question. So our next question, uh, leading up to this, there were lots of excitement and conversations about your elementary school years. I understand some of us might've been classmates <laughs> around the same time, but community members know that Dunbar Elementary, Franklin Park Elementary, mm -hmm. Heights Elementary, and Dunbar Junior Senior High School with the educational and institutional pillars of the community during the era of racial segregation. So in your recollection, share with us in our panel today and our attendees, what schools did you attend? Dunbar, Franklin Park, Heights, or Dunbar Junior Senior High School? And what was your experience like as you recall at one of those schools? Well, I attended Dunbar Elementary and Heights was not in the was not even in the picture because there were students. In fact, my daughter's mother-in-law 
was bused from Harlem Heights mm -hmm. to Fort Myers to attend Dunbar Elementary School. Mm -hmm. And we had three bus drivers that I remember. I remember Mr. Joe Baker, Mr. Uh, Stallsworth, mm -hmm. and uh, Miss Allie Mae Davis. And those were, and they brought students in from Alva. Mm -hmm. And then I want to tell you about my grandmother, Mrs. Clorietta Harbin, who taught at uh, Franklin Park. So she would drive her car to Punta Gata every morning, pick up students, bring them to Fort Myers, teach school all day, drive the bus back to take the students to back to Punta Gata, and then come back home. And she did that for over 40 years wow. because there were no high schools. I think it, there was an elementary school in Punta Gata, but no high school. And so you'll find people like Wilma Carter and the Gallmans who actually graduated from high school in Fort Myers. And she would go and pick them up every morning before school. Mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. So you attended Dunbar Elementary. Anybody else attend Dunbar Elementary? Ms. Young, what was your experience like at Dunbar Elementary? Uh, attending Dunbar Elementary allowed me to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. I did not feel inferior to my counterparts. And I was not judged as I felt when <coughs> we integrated. I lost a level of confidence uh, because uh, due to institutionalized racism, I always felt that I was being judged. But attending Dunbar, I felt comfortable. I felt it was an extension of my family. Mm -hmm. uh, our teachers uh, went above and beyond the academics. Mm -hmm. They taught us ethics. They taught us um, um, those things that your parents would teach you mm -hmm. at home. It was an extension. Mm -hmm. And our parents supported the teachers and the teachers supported the parents. And if a teacher called and said, mm -hmm. Maddie did this or mm -hmm. Maddie did that. All right. There was no question as mm -hmm. to uh, whether I did it or not. It was the teacher said you did it. You did it. And you did it. So um, I felt comfortable. I didn't have to be judged. Um, uh, and, and it was just a, a good experience. And um, our classmates were competitive. Mm -hmm. We competed against each other to see who could be the smartest. And we had to stand and deliver there. Um, it was it was just a good feeling. Uh, so I heard a little rumor. I heard that you and Miss Campbell were classmates in the first grade. Is that, is that yes, correct? Yes, we were. And uh, she talked about we were competitive. I remember she had beautiful, Miss Young had a beautiful handwriting. And so I determined that I was going to write neatly just like her, mm -hmm. and I was going to have a beautiful handwriting. Those were the kinds of things that they instilled in us. Mm -hmm. So you aren't jealous mm -hmm. of a person because right. they can exactly. do something. You uh, uh, try to obtain that same level of perfection. Exactly. And so, and we graduated in a high school class and we still get together that we have always been competitive. Mm -hmm. It was, and it was a, um, it was a fun, healthy kind of competition, mm -hmm. yeah. not a cutthroat kind of yeah. competition. Yeah. So because she had such a beautiful handwriting, I wanted to have one and I worked on that. Okay, so handwriting. So I want to see <laughs> your handwriting. Oh, uh, hopefully my handwriting is still up to par. Okay. Uh, disclosure, Miss Young was my second grade teacher. So <laughs> thank I still like it. Uh, so I want to stay on that point of transition for a second. Mm -hmm. When we talk about resources, so you, Dr. Knight, and Mr. Barnes, and the rest of the panel, were you aware of the fact that the story goes that the books and the resources that were used at Dunbar Elementary were the leftover books from the other schools in town. Were you all aware of that? And you want to share any recollections that you have about the resources that your teachers were given? Uh, well, in, indeed, and that was at both uh, elementary schools. I was fortunate enough to go to Franklin Park for my first, third, and fourth grade, and Dunbar Elementary for fifth and sixth grades. And um, the teachers were dynamic on, on both ends of the spectrum, but going at the Dunbar, I was able to get away from mom oh, because okay. mom was at Franklin Park. <laughs> uh, so I, I got a little freedom uh, from, a, you know, from for a while. But I can remember with the books that they gave us, they also gave us a paper uh, book cover. Uh, taught us how to cover the book so that it wouldn't look as bad. And of course, other 
students' names were on the inside mm -hmm. cover. Mm -hmm. And J. Cole in English was stamped on the books that we oh. used. Mm -hmm. And we did not get book covers. Mm -hmm. We were told to take the old uh, paper bag. Okay. And mm -hmm. we yeah. used okay. those paper bags mm -hmm. and we made mm -hmm. uh, book, book covers, covers for yeah. our books. Mm -hmm. But but we learned to read, we learned to write, we learned mathematics, learned we phonics. learned every phonics, everything. Mm -hmm. And so just because the resources may have been used, um, our teachers challenged our brains to be the very best that we could be. And so to, to establish some dates and where we are now, we're talking about not to date anybody, but <laughs> we're talking about the 19, 19, it was fair to say the late 1950s, but early or mid 1960s, yeah. the time yeah, frame sure. that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Anything sure. you want to add, Mr. Barnes, about your recollections? Just that I, uh, back to Maddie's coming, I think I really love what she's talked about, about those teachers being sort of like uh, your second parents. I mean, I walked from Second Street to Dunbar. I mean, there must have been five, six teachers that lived in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. yeah. Shirley yeah. Watson was mm -hmm. my yeah. first big teacher. Mm -hmm. It's Emma Spade now. So they all were like, Pretty much walk by the house, mm -hmm. so uh, you just know how to conduct yourself mm -hmm. uh, when you when you were in the classroom or even in that community doing something. But the, the the level in which they cared about what what they were teaching you and how they cared about you and and, and even down to how you dress and everything else was was very important. But uh, I shared it with you. My my father said it with me. It's a statement that I, I I try to share with some kids and also with teachers that uh, my father said stay true to my head because I know where I was going. He said, son, when you leave my house, you represent me. Mm -hmm. Wherever you go and embarrass me, mm -hmm. I have the right to come to embarrass you. <laughs> so my, my teachers were never going to call my house because my father had already told me the lesson. So I made, I was like, if they need the erase board, I, I would take care of all the chores. But, but that, was, that was a good thing. I understand because he was going to believe, he said to me. If they tell me something, son, I'm going to believe them. Mm -hmm. They're not here to hurt you. I, su I support them. And we're going, right. to support, we're going to support their decisions. So you know how to conduct yourself and how to behave when, they were, when you're in a classroom, when you're not in the presence of your parents. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And so, Dr. Knight, you mentioned your mother, Dr. Ann Knight, who eventually was elected to the Fort Myers City Council along with Ms. Young's mother, and she's featured in this exhibit. And Mr. Barnes mentioned the important role of educators in the community. Now, your mother got her start as an educator here and a graduate of Dunbar High School. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about the roles of educators as role models and leaders in our community during that era? Well, the, the teachers um, coming from uh, historical Black mm -hmm. institutions, mm -hmm. uh, in my perspective, they came here with a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and they came to make a difference. Uh, it wasn't about having three months off during the summer because guess what they did for those three months? Prepare. They taught school, yeah. or they got a part-time job for the next year, and preparing for for uh, for, for the next year. Um, and most of the teachers um, were more role models um, because they know that they were there to help form the clay, uh, the students to make them better uh, um, people. And Johnny Roberts. Uh, one of my mother's third grade students came to speak at her homegoing celebration, mm -hmm. and he accredited his success in being a world-renowned writer um, for the Washington uh, Post and, and uh, different magazines to, uh, to mom mm -hmm. and, and pushing him and telling him that he can be whatever he wanted to be or whatever he decided to be, to be the best mm -hmm. uh, at what he would be. Uh, doing uh, in his life. So as well as a teacher, yes, absolutely, they, they were role models. And I know during that era, it seems like most um, students were being groomed to, to be teachers. Uh, and, and, and that went on for a long time. If you were going to college, you were going to be a teacher. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was very rewarding. And uh, thank God for my mother. And, and, and other teachers and mothers and fathers like that legacy. Absolutely. And one of the things that I'd like to add is I loved our community yes. because it didn't matter if you were a teacher, mm -hmm. a domestic worker, mm -hmm. you worked in the fields. Mm -hmm. It was one community. Mm -hmm. And any adult could chastise you. Right. Any adult 
could give you constructive criticism and most adults gave you encouragement. Mm -hmm. And so it was a full, it was a circle. I mean, we went to different churches. You were at Trinity, uh, Dr. Knight, mm -hmm. uh, Maddie Young and I were both at Mount Olive mm -hmm. and uh, you were at Friendship, were you? And, and our, our, our son was not yet born, but anyway, he was eventually at friendship. But it didn't matter what church you went to. It didn't matter what school you went to. Everybody felt the need to protect the youth of the community. Mm -hmm. They were a village. They were a yes. village. Yes. And yes. I so appreciate that. And as I look back on my life and think things over, <laughs> I think about mm -hmm. all of the good people that came mm -hmm. through my life. Mm -hmm. I think about, there was a lady at my church, Miss Evelyn Gritter. She was a domestic worker, mm -hmm. but she, she taught church etiquette and didn't even know she was teaching church mm -hmm. etiquette, okay? Mm -hmm. She taught you how to sit as a young lady. She taught you not to, to, to talk loud and, and be boisterous. Everybody was a teacher. Mm -hmm. Those who were in the school system as my parents mm -hmm. were, and those that you met along the way. That's right. mm -hmm. So I wanna to transition to Ms. Campbell's point about the community. Mm -hmm. um, I heard something about the Maypole. Can you all tell me what that was? I heard that was a sacred tradition over at the elementary school. I'm seeing some <laughs> laughter here. So tell our attendees tonight some of those special traditions about flattening the maypole and what that represented in the community for you. So it was May Day, mm -hmm. and May Day was May 1st. Correct. And the week, and Mr. Barnes reminded me that it was for the entire week. We dressed up. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a big um, event, and it was... The plaiting of the maypole was the uh, climax of mm -hmm. that week. And we were dressed and, and the girls went around the maypole in a certain way and the guys went around the maypole a certain <laughs> way and eventually it was plaited. Now, you know that it had its roots in segregation mm -hmm. and it had its roots about when certain communities found out that they were emancipated. And that is the history of the Maypole. But when we, we just saw it as a fun time that we got to dress up, we got to interact with our schoolmates. And it was, it was almost an, a community event. And so that, that's a great connection of understanding how emancipation was a major part of celebration and events like the Maypole, Latin the Maypole. And I know the Lee County Black History Society is working diligently to ensure that Florida's Emancipation Day, mm -hmm. in addition to recognizing Juneteenth, but that Florida's Emancipation Day in the month of May mm -hmm. is recognized. So if, if our panelists and those who are attending tonight, mm -hmm. please check out the Lee County Black History Society at LeeCountyBlackHistorySociety.org mm -hmm. for upcoming information about what the society is planning to bring some of those traditions back. Mm -hmm. So speaking of traditions, we're moving toward the 1960s. We've established we're in the 1960s here. I can hear a little Motown playing in the background. <laughs> but moving toward the year 1964, Ms. Young, you mentioned the Blaylock. And so for our attendees tonight, specifically Mr. John Blaylock and Ms. Mildred Blaylock, who are members of Friendship Missionary Baptist Church under the leadership of Reverend Isidore Edwards. Mm -hmm. And not just the Blaylock family, but there were other plaintiffs on that lawsuit, school the Lee, mm -hmm. I sued the Lee County School Board mm -hmm. to force the case of Blaylock versus Lee County Board of Public Instruction. Mm -hmm. And the key part of knowing that 1964 happens after, 10 years after the landmark Brown versus Board of Education mm -hmm. case mm -hmm. with all deliberate speed. Right. As we saw, it took us a long time to get to that point to push back against it. But the lawsuit was established in 1964. And from the 1964 year up until 1969, mm -hmm. were very turbulent years related to how would Lee County respond to desegregation or integrating the school. Ms. Young, you want to add any context? You mentioned the Blaylock family and your recollection of that lawsuit. Anything you'd like to add about the Blaylock case and the Blaylock family? Well, they were my neighbors. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Blaylock wanted Robin to attend an integrated school. So he was one of the initial plaintiffs. But I remember um, when we did integrate, and like I said, I went to Freedom of Choice, mm -hmm. his daughter, Priscilla, who was in um, one grade higher than me, we both went together to Fort Myers High School. Okay. Uh, so we went from Fort Myers Middle to Fort Myers High School, and then leading up to uh, the time when the district, because of the timeliness or lack of timeliness to integrate, 
we went from premature to uh, full busing and um, uh, student assignment. So that resulted in my moving from Fort Myers High, which was on the south side of town, over to the north side of town. And uh, that's when I moved over into uh, North High School and uh, we attended school there um, as a result of the uh, um, student assignment and busing. So Ms. Young, and we'll come back to you, Ms. Campbell, but I wanna stay on this one for a second. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Freedom of Choice Plan? Like what was that set up and how did it differ than being assigned to a school? Okay, Freedom of Choice um, was, was uh, required that those who wanted to leave the all black schools, mm -hmm. whereas Greta stayed at Dunbar, uh, my mom chose to send me or require me to go and integrate schools to satisfy the Freedom of Choice mm -hmm. plan. So there were a number of us that went over uh, to Fort Myers, and I think Fort Myers Middle School, Fort Myers junior High, high. Yeah, mm -hmm. Junior High, mm -hmm. that was the first school to receive us. Mm -hmm. And then because the district was uh, slow about fully integrating the schools, then we moved from there to busing and student assignment. So that was when Greta said that that summer they closed Dunbar and then they ended up, everybody had to go uh, to their assigned schools. So that's how that transition occurred. So that was when I no longer could remain at Fort Myers <coughs> Junior High School. I was required to go through busing, through student assignment, across the, the river, Kumpetchi, uh, River every day to North High over on Orange Grove Boulevard. Uh, so I'm talking to your classmate over here. So Ms. Young shared her experience of freedom of choice. What was your experience like, Ms. Campbell, in those early years? So because the school district was uh, so in, so adamant that they would not fully integrate, yeah. what they did was they took um, some black teachers and sent them over to white schools. Mm -hmm. And I can remember two of them being uh, Mrs. Ida S. Baker, for okay. whom Ida Baker High School mm -hmm. is named, mm -hmm. and Ms. Pat Brown. I remember those two. There were others. And, and they sent them to white schools. They sent white teachers to um, black schools. Mm -hmm. And they wanted that to satisfy mm -hmm. the court order because they did not want to fully integrate. Mm -hmm. And they did that for, I think it was like at least two years because Miss mm -hmm. Ida Baker, when I was in seventh grade, started out being my homeroom teacher. And then they moved her to um, Fort Myers High School, I think is where she went. Mm -hmm. So they did not want to integrate. And it was because of that, that we finally got into the forced mm -hmm. integration mm -hmm. that, and it was forced. Mm -hmm. And unlike what I'm reading there, the three high schools that were in existence at that time were Fort Myers High, mm -hmm. North High, and Cypress. Cypress. Mm -hmm. And Cypress was a brand new school that didn't even have a cafeteria yet. Mm -hmm. But those were the only three high schools mm -hmm. in Lee County. Riverdale was not in existence mm -hmm. right. in 1969. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, transitioning to that point, for our timeline sake, we're moving toward the latter part of the 1960s. So the Blaylock mm -hmm. case is filed in 1965. Mm -hmm. The school district comes up with a freedom of choice plan that yes. was to say yes. that black residents and white residents, if they chose, yes. exactly. could go to schools. And so I'm hearing Ms. Young, you said that your mother made the decision, but Ms. Campbell initially you stayed. Mm -hmm. So let's move forward to the 1969, 1970 mm -hmm. school year. Mm -hmm. And by the end of that year, the federal court said that the district had to close all of the black schools. Mm -hmm. There was lots of discussion going back and forth if it was mm -hmm. going to remain open, but there was one caveat that happens that next school year. Mm -hmm. And the caveat was that the Dunbar High School site, the former site on High Street, which is now the community school, mm -hmm. and the site of Dunbar where it was in 1969 would open as a seventh grade center. Mm -hmm. And so that's how the initial response. You all recall when those two campuses opened up as locations for all seventh graders, black and white, had to go to school in the Dunbar community as the first initial opportunity for integration. You all recall that? I remember that, but I thought 
I'm not sure that it happened that that same year, mm -hmm. the 69-70 school year. Mm -hmm. I think the school, Dunbar High School, closed, mm -hmm. and they were using it as a warehouse storage. And it was one of the newest high schools because it was built on the same plan as right. Cypress High School. Remember, there are only three high schools at this time. Mm -hmm. And it's built on, Dunbar High School is built on the same plan, or was built on the same plan as Cypress High School. Mm -hmm. So I remember, because actually I remember the, the Dunbar Community School, as it was then called. It was something else, and then it was Sun Coast and mm -hmm. something else. But both of those schools closed for certain periods of time mm -hmm. when there was nothing going on there. And the community, I can remember, we had a march, right. and the community was adamant that we needed to use those schools. Right. Now, Dunbar Elementary was closed. Franklin Park, and till so today, no, it remained... It was a seventh grade center. Mr. Jeremiah Primus was the principal. Mm -hmm. They moved him from Dunbar High School as the principal to this center at uh, Franklin Park uh, Middle School then, and then Franklin Park mm -hmm. reopened. So there was some jockeying where they were actually, their plan was to close all of the schools in the Dunbar community because they didn't want white children coming to this community mm -hmm. to go to school. Mm -hmm. Now, right. that's being kind of blunt, but that's it. That's the way it works. And so, and thank you for that point, Ms. Campbell, uh, with the transition. So going back into the archival parts of the news press, that was the initial encounter of what to do. But it was it was the 6970 when they opened it as the seventh grade center for that year. And then eventually they transitioned, they kept Franklin Park closed, closed the elementary school. And so something interesting you mentioned about the rally was something that was really instrumental by your mother as well. The concern was they were closing Dunbar and they were removing the nomenclature of Dunbar from the building. Mm -hmm. As the school district was moving toward opening up the seventh grade centers, mm -hmm. the concern was, well, is it punishment? This is how the newspaper and the editorial, I believe it was the Miami Herald, said, is the school board trying to punish the black community for pushing the integration lawsuit? And is that punishment in the version of taking away the Dunbar name? And so that was a lot of that. In fact, there was movement of kids walking up to the school to have the name put back. Ray Williams was the superintendent at the time mm -hmm. to ensure that the name returned. But I want to jump over to something that Ms. Campbell said and kind of get everybody else's impression of it. Can uh, I just add one? Yeah, of Campbell, course, Mr. Because I think it was a, I don't remember, remember reading some quote where, where uh, Judge Anderson wrote about the name because there was some concern about the name being Dunbar. Was it a slant to that name? Thank you. That was because when they pronounced it, they pronounced it dumb bar. That's right. That's D U M B A R. Right. I that. I mean, we know that it is named after Paul Lawrence that's Dunbar. What that's what he did. That's my point. He came back and said, no, this school is named after Paul Lawrence Dunbar. An educated or poet. They was like, goes right. They were stuck on that. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. And it's the connection to the name. Wow. So um, to transition us here to the next point, and Ms. Campbell, thank you for that, for opening the door to the next phase of the questions here. Oh, yeah. um, integration happens. Can you all tell us where you ended up after the schools are officially closed in 6970 for the 6970 school year, the first year, as Ms. Young said, the forced integration. Mm -hmm. They closed the schools, the teachers were redistributed. Mm -hmm. Where did you all end up? Leaving your, your, your comfort of the schools you had been used to and tell us what grades you were in the year you had to go to a new school. Okay, I I think I moved in 10th grade, like I said, mm -hmm. on high. Okay. Mm -hmm. That year, it was okay. It was, we were getting used to North High. And I think that the common piece there was sports. Okay. That was our common ground, 10th mm -hmm. grade. Um, for whatever reasons, I think 11th grade, 69, and I believe that's when mm -hmm. everyone came mm -hmm. over. That was a very tumultuous year for us. Okay. Um, I know that during transitions between hallways and classes, Black students stuck with each other. Mm -hmm. They hang with each other because they felt comfortable. Uh, they ate lunch together. Um, I think the, the one times that, the few times that we would integrate would be in the classroom or um, 
sports events because we had some outstanding athletes. And uh, I think sports just brought us all together. Uh, but I remember that year, I guess uh, something happened. We, we were arguing or we felt like as black students at North, we felt like they didn't want us there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know transitioning from Fort Myers High School or Fort Myers to Fort Myers Junior mm -hmm. High to North was like night and day. Mm -hmm. At Fort Myers High School, I felt like to be involved with school events activities, mm -hmm. you had to be very smart, intelligent, or rich. Mm -hmm. That was the standard. Or, but at North High, it was like night and day. Mm -hmm. Everyone was involved. We came together. But still, there was that, um, when you think about groups and how team building, okay. um, it was like storming for us. Okay. It was that year where it was just, you know, first you go through, you form, you storm, you norm. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that year we integrated in North, we were storming. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a fracas in the, in the courtyard. And... Students started fighting, or someone hit someone, and um, teachers were there trying to break up fights. <clears throat> and you know they were right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Unlike how they're trained today to call security or something. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time there was no training on the part of, of, of teachers or or, or uh, administrators on how to deal with uh, riots right. okay. and that those types of things activities. But um, the students, uh, we felt like we were not uh, involved and uh, we felt like they didn't want us there. So after the big fight in the courtyard, someone said, and I, I'll never forget if someone said, let's go, let's go back home. They don't want us here. We don't want to be here. Mm -hmm. So several of us said, let's make it peaceful. I don't know where that came from, but they said, let's make it peaceful. Let's not fight, let's not act up. Let's just get in the line and walk back uh, to Dunbar. Mm -hmm. across so the across the bridge. So we- can you, can you tell us what you mean for those who might not be familiar with okay. the geography? We, we walked out of North Fort Myers High School, the black students mm -hmm. who were bus there. We decided one day, I'll never forget it, but we had just got there. I mean, the, the first few bells were ringing. And the students said, let's, let's just leave. We've had enough of this. Let's just uh, walk back across the bridge and go home. And I'll never forget as I was walking, because I was one of the ones leaving the line. Okay. And um, as we were walking, all I could think about was, oh, Lord, I'm on So how long do you think that, how long do you think that march would have been going from North High back to where? Well, um, the bridge is around, well, the one way is two miles. Mm -hmm. So if you think of that, you know, and we had time, to get to the we bridge. We had to get to the bridge. We walked down Orange Grove Boulevard, down Palm, uh, down Pondella Road mm -hmm. to 41, old 41 mm -hmm. to Blue Sachi. Yeah, and then we walked down Second Street and uh, we came together over near Dunbar. And uh, as we were walking, the media uh, got a hold of uh, what was happening. And they were filming us on, and they, you know, they were saying they walked out quietly, they walked out silently, peacefully, you know. And all we could think about now, well, all I could think about is Jam was, Lord, how am I going to get back in school? I got to graduate. My mom's going to kill me when I, when I get. That's, that's what was on my mind. But when we, uh, did get back home in Dunbar, we were met with Reverend Edwards. We were met with uh, people like Willie Green. Um, they were there. And um, the next thing I know, the next day we were meeting with the school board. Uh, I think it was Ray Williams. Um, and we were meeting and we were resolving the issues. And I think from then on, uh, that was the turning point where in we came together as integrated students where we realized that uh, how much we had learned by going to school with uh, students of different racial and ethnic backgrounds. Uh, we realized what diversity was all about. 
And I think for me, it was, it was helpful in that having gone through that experience, I now uh, am better able to deal with diversity and deal with uh, a lot of my classmates who were of a different race or different ethnicity. Um, so I think we just had to do that. We, I mean, that was just a part of the plan to, to, to cross over into um, better understanding mm -hmm. each other. And I think Blacks, Whites, we all came together as a body and uh, that, that just helped us. I think that was the, the, the norming piece of it. How do you storm it? So interesting question. Ms. Campbell, you were at Cypress Lake and Dr. Knight, you were at Fort Myers. Were there any events that you recall that happened on your respective campuses that might mirror what Ms. Young encountered at North? Uh, Fort Myers High School, 1973, um, mm -hmm. my senior year. And this is the same group of students that transitioned from a wood ripple to a wave. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we all knew each other. Things went well at Fort Myers Junior High. And not until 1973, there was an uh, interaction between a black male student and a white male student who I think was an athlete, football player, if I'm not mistaken. And um, both students went to their peers and probably told two different mm -hmm. stories. And the rumor got around school, no one really knowing what really happened or what was the reason for it and punches were thrown and before you knew it, that was the riot of 1973 at Fort Myers High School. Um, and communication would have been the key to, to, to resolve that. Um, I don't think that it should have happened mm -hmm. um, because some people were throwing punches and nobody was throwing punches. Mm -hmm. And this was class of 73 and you have been with these, the white counterparts going on six years. And uh, that was the first altercation ever with those students from 68 to 73. Well, not the first altercation. There was an altercation in that first year, the 69, 70 year. My cousin, Carmen Johnson, her name okay. was, was there then. And they had, it was around the Sadie Hawkins dance. That's all I remember. Okay, that must be just before uh -huh. the ninth grade class came mm -hmm. over. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that Sadie Hawkins is familiar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At Cyprus, it was a little different because when we got there, they when we were in about eighth or ninth grade, the students who lived in Harlem Heights went to, to Cyprus. They stopped mm -hmm. busing them mm -hmm. to Dunbar. So when we got there, they were already familiar with going to school with Black students, et cetera, et cetera. The part that was different or difficult for me, so difficult that I left after one year and went to college, mm -hmm. it was difficult because I was accustomed to seeing all of the persons who had been student body presidents and all of the clubs that we had at Dunbar. And I saw that as a leader, as a role that I wanted to take on. And when we got there, they said, oh, we, we made all of our decisions last year. Mm -hmm. So we were sort of, you know, mm -hmm. out, put out. Mm -hmm. And um, it just, I just was so disheartened by the whole thing mm -hmm. that I took the PSAT and got an offer to go to Spelman, and I said, I'm out of here. <laughs> After the 11th grade year, I said, I'm out. I just, uh, it was, and I can't say that there were, there were no uh, fights or anything that I remember. Um, I do remember that they would search the Black students. They would stop the bus at the middle school and search the Black students and then bring them into the high school, but there were no altercations that I remember. The students were very kind. Most of the teachers were kind. And I tell this one story, and I know Mr. E's trying to get me be quiet. No, no, no. I want to tell you the story about I was taking a, um, an English literature class, and I've always liked to write. And, I, and it was an in-class essay that we had to write. And Ms. Young talked about when we were at Dunbar Elementary, we always felt encouraged. We never felt put down. Mm -hmm. When I took the, the, uh, my essay to the teacher and she read it, she said, you didn't write this. I said, yes, I did. I just sat here and write, wrote it. She says, you are capable of writing this. You know I marched downstairs and told my mother mm -hmm. what she said. 
And so she believed and, you know, I have to give her some props and say, if you've been taught something all of your life, what do you believe for what you've been taught until you learn differently? Mm -hmm. But she said, no, you couldn't have done this. It, it just deflated me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I was like a balloon that had gone flat. I just could not believe it. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. I mean, I really worked hard on this essay in class. Mm -hmm. So where else was right. I going to get it from if I was writing it mm -hmm. in class? Mm -hmm. So, wow, that was great. You know, I've never cut you off, Ms. Campbell. That's great. So I know we're getting to the end of our conversation. We want to leave a little time to answer any questions that we might have in the chat. Our FGCU staff is working on adding any questions that we have from there. But to wrap us up, I want one question, Mr. Barnes. If you could just give us a quick analysis. I know you happen to be an underclassman and watching mm -hmm. the folks in Ms. Young, uh, who was Maddie Shoemaker at the time, mm -hmm. walk across the bridge. But what did that mean to you? knowing that there were students who were older than you at the time, right. but they were taking a stand of treatment that would affect you eventually as you were going through the system. And I recall that situation well because I've never been publicized and I should, I can remember seeing like, I think they actually got a police escort across that bridge. We did, and, like, we did. I'm nice just like, wow, okay. <laughs> we got some people over there. But you know, I really thought it was more about the celebration of like history. I don't know why I thought that had something to do with it. But but I thought that had to do. But it was just encouraging to know that that they were taking a stand uh, uh, as black students, and that we were eventually, especially in my case, I lived on that south on that south side. I was school, I eventually ended up at North Mass High School, uh, which is where uh, she was. She was along with actually I would say with great respect, my brother Dwayne was a great friend of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we all grew up right there together. So it is, it's just remarkable that uh, we that we had that experience of watching those. Elders actually stand up for themselves and actually do well over there, especially with sports. If they love the yes. right, they develop that kind of talent. But I want to talk about Harris situation in 73 because um, I know my father was in police up during that time, but one of my mentors in business, of course, was retired Major Newton. I actually walked me through the door of the sheriff's department. But he talked about that day uh, in detail that uh, they knew there was a riot going on there. They specifically told the black cops they could not go over there. Wow. But during that time, black cops were being allowed control all over the city. Mm -hmm. They simply announced to me that you cannot take part in that situation. So they make sure that only white cops. And why is that? Well, we know why. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. So, and yes. then, and yes. the coverage in the newspaper did show that there were some incidents with students being confronted with dogs mm -hmm. at Fort Myers High School. That, so yeah. that was a lot of the. Mr. Major Jim issues. Stevens mm -hmm. was confronted with a dog, and mm -hmm. they said they thought. That he was a student. Now, anyone who knew wow. Coach Steve knew that he was a <laughs> big guy. And there was a he was not to be confused with the yes. student. And if you don't, I don't know if you remember, but he left public education for a couple of years and worked for the city because he was so disheartened that they would sick the dog on him wow. at Fort Myers High School. He, Jim Stevens was the first coach at an integrated location mm -hmm. he had basketball coach. And he was a big daughter. guy. You could not no, no. mistake him for a student. Not at all. No. So for the panel, and looking at some of the questions that we received, I think this is a good segue to kind of contemporary. And so the question is, from one of our attendees, how can we continue to influence change in positive and meaningful ways as students and a diverse community? How can we continue to influence positive change in meaningful ways as students and a community? Anybody want to take that one? I think it sounds simple, but I think uh, I read this quote and I have promised that I will live by it the rest of my life. If you can be anything, be kind. Mm -hmm. And so it starts with respecting each other mm -hmm. and being kind to each other. Mm -hmm. And that goes both ways. And when there is confusion or you think that you're being disrespected, handle <laughs> it appropriately. Mm -hmm. Fighting and all name calling, that's not an appropriate way to handle it. Mm -hmm. And we have to teach our students kids, and I'm saying white kids and black kids, how to handle differences. Dr. Knight and I can disagree, but we don't have to be disagreeable. Mm -hmm. And we, there is a, a professional way, an intelligent way mm -hmm. to handle differences. And we will always have differences. Mm -hmm. uh, we have time for one additional question before we get out on time. And so the last question is about the integration of Edison Community College. And so anybody have any perspective on that? And I believe, Miss Young, your Aunt Daisy was in the original group of individuals who graduated from medicine, and they were not allowed to actually walk. 
Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, Edison Junior College, mm -hmm. they were being over the overseers of that and serving at the Board of Trustees was mm -hmm. the Lee County School Board. And so one of the first integration lawsuits happened about the Edison uh, Junior College also. But I remember mm -hmm. when the Edison College, when it first started, mm -hmm. Um, for for Black. Blacks mm -hmm. was on Dunbar Elementary's campus. There were some portables there, right, okay. and they were on Dunbar Elementary's mm -hmm. campus. They were not allowed to go, I guess, the main campus with the Gwen Building. I don't know where it was, but they were not allowed to go to the Gwen Building. Mm -hmm. They were um, relegated to these portables at Dunbar right. Elementary School. Mm -hmm. So that in itself tells you the mindset of the people. Uh, we want higher education. We will allow them, but we don't want them with us. Do you know what year we were allowed on so, campus? Because I graduated in 1975. 75 as a class president. Yes, sir. So the transition would have started uh, at the time, Dr. Henry Francis Gilmore, who was a former principal mm -hmm. of Dunbar Junior Senior High School. He also served as the dean of the Black Dunbar campus of Edison. And one of the first lawsuits that they tried to establish in 64 would have been the transition from Edison uh, being the Dunbar campus to transitioning to having the students be able to attend the campus proper. So uh, Dr. Gilmore, I believe Ms. Alma Cambridge and also Reuben Robinson were a few of the folks who were on the faculty mm -hmm. at the Dunbar campus. Those folks are reassigned and the students who were coming in under the year of integration at Edison were allowed to graduate uh, but the story tells us now that those students were not allowed to march mm -hmm. in the integrated system. And, and the story, I understand that John Daisy was a part of that group mm -hmm. and their diplomas were mailed to them. So okay. I think that's an opportunity now to dig even deeper mm -hmm. into some of those stories and kind of understand. And to your point, Ms. Campbell. I think Dr. Chapman may have been in that group also. Well, she really? Dr. I think Maxine Dr. Chapman? Maxine Chapman mm -hmm. was in that group. So, mm -hmm. so yes. Mm -hmm. And I had heard that um, Ms. Daisy sat was one of the first students. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you know, that's an important thing to know that we're talking here for the students who are attending and community members. We're not talking about ancient history. We're talking about history that is contemporary, that oh, yes. is still in the residual mm -hmm. mindsets of a lot of people who are still around. And that's why it's important to understand how our history can shape our perceptual filters and our frames of reference. I mean, so we have time for one additional question. And so this question will go and we'll go and take, let's see which one we want to do here. Let's go with this one. This is a question for you, Ms. Campbell. Did the teacher who won the lawsuit and lost his job get any back pay? So did your Uncle Charles get any back he pay? He did not get any back pay. And the teachers in Broward County promised him that they would help support him and his family until he got another job. Mm -hmm. They sent not a penny. Yeah. And yeah. so he was destitute for a while. Wow. 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 Okay. And I think we'll take one more and we'll go with this one. Uh, in segregation, in addition to Jim Crow de jure segregation, were the areas where black live, Blacks live also separated by distance? So I'm kind of revisiting that question a little bit. Can you describe what the community looked like and what you would consider to be the borders of the Dunbar community? And were there opportunities for um, intersectionalities between the races based on where you live? So were groups moving across for the Blacks community going in white neighborhoods? Can you tell us what that was like? Well, you know that the railroad track is the, is the separator in every community, not just in Fort Myers, but in every community, you can find the railroad track. That's correct. Across the railroad track, you'll find the original uh, community. And so at that time, when I was really young, it was the railroad track and probably about Ford or Henderson in that area. And then, you know, as we began to migrate, we didn't migrate uh, across the bridge. We began to populate areas around Dunbar, what is now Dunbar High School and a little farther east. But the the dividing line was the railroad track, and it was understood you that blacks were not allowed across the railroad track after dark. After dark. Mm -hmm. And so for unless you were going to work. Going to work, and that's a valid point. You were allowed to 
and so forth the poser of the question if you'd like to know more about that question and the geographic boundaries of the dunbar community we encourage you to come out here and visit our friends here at the library there's a nice map in the lobby area that shows that and if you all notice when you come out to visit us you see there's a railroad track that shows that symbolic division between the communities here um, we're now at the seven o'clock hour i want to thank you all so much for being with us Ms. greta kimball Ms. Maddie Shoemaker Young, no, I'm sorry, Ms. Greta Stebbins Campbell, Ms. Maddie Shoemaker Young, Mr. Charles Barnes, and Dr. Harrison Knight. Thank you all so much for joining us. And to our friends here at Florida Gulf Coast University and the library, we appreciate your support. And to all of us who signed in, uh, we can't see you out there in virtual space, but we know you're out there with us and we thank you for your questions. And anyone like to wrap us up for the night before we depart and say good night to our friends? I would like to say that no child is born with the prejudice. Mm -hmm. And it starts at home. We're not born to dislike anybody. It starts, it starts at home. It starts at home. That being said, the pastor gave us a benediction. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to FGCU. And thank you to all of you for attending. Have a wonderful night.